Uh, a very warm welcome, everyone. My name is Axel Threlfall. I'm editor at large at Reuters, based out of London. Uh, we've got a, a, a big topic on the table, four super speakers, only 45 minutes. So let me keep this introduction uh, very brief. Our sub Of course, that presumes that these institutions were sufficiently invigorated before then. Uh, perhaps they were, uh, or perhaps the past few years has thrown up uh, opportunities for new approaches and new strategies, a chance uh, not just to re reinvigorate, uh, but to re-envision. Um, Secretary General Guterres in September called for a renewed commitment to a rules-based order with the UN at, at its centre. Um, as guardians of the common good, leaders, he said, have the duty to promote and support a reformed, reinvigorated uh, multilateral system. So we've got plenty to talk about. Let's bring the panel in. Munia Akram is president of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Uh, welcome to you, Ambassador. Uh, Kate Brown is governor of the U.S. Uh, state of Oregon. Marta Morgan is deputy minister of foreign affairs uh, in Canada. And we await, and hopefully he will join us soon, Miguel de Serpa Suarez, UN Undersecretary uh, General for Legal Affairs and UN Legal Counsel. Um, in fact, I think Miguel has just joined. Uh, still waiting for your video, Miguel, but uh, hopefully you can hear us. Um, Marta, le le let me kick it off with you. How hard is the US leaning in now under Joe Biden? And do you think it's enough, uh, Marta, to, to, to reinvigorate institutions so they're gonna be fit for the, for the 21st century? Uh, great. Thanks, Axel, for that question and for letting me lead off. And uh, welcome to my fellow panelists. It's uh, great to be here to be able to speak with you today. It's uh, an amazing event, and I'm really glad to be part of it. Um, and I think uh, that this is a very timely topic. Um, Canada, um, as you know, is a strong supporter of the rules-based international order, um, which includes international institutions, international law, and international norms. Um, and we believe that this is essential for managing competing international interests, but over the last 75 years has advanced global prosperity, uh, glo has contributed to global security, and also to the evolution of human rights. So it's a very important topic um, that we're discussing, discussing today from our perspective. Um, I think this administration has made it clear um, that they will engage um, and that they are determined to listen to and work with their partners. Um, you know, a good example is just this past February, um, barely a month into the administration, Canada and the United States, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau um, agreed to a roadmap for a new Canada-US partnership. And if you look at that roadmap, a lot of it is related to bilateral domestic issues. It's about fighting COVID. It's about building the economy back better. Um, it's, about the, it's about climate change. Um, it's about uh, diversity and inclusion. And it's about promoting security and alliances. But mm -hmm. that thread of, um, of recognizing the importance of international norms, of working with allies, of working together to strengthen the key global institutions in all of those areas runs right through the roadmap, um, whether it's um, strengthening the WHO, um, whether it's working together um, to implement the Paris Accord on climate change, um, mm -hmm. or whether it's our shared commitment to institutions like the UN, the G7, the WTO. Um, so I think out of the gate, certainly from our perspective, the, this administration has shown itself to be quite uh, committed and energetic on this front. All right. Do you, do you think, just a quick follow-up, Marta, do you think the wariness that has built up over the past three years among the Allies, uh, among others, um, you know, given the way a, a, a lot of people have been, been, been treated, uh, do you think that is de still detrimental? Uh, to these relationships going forward, to, to the efforts to reinvigorate uh, these institutions. Well, look, I think that the um, I think that both the messaging and the actions of the new administration are very well received. Uh, I think that 
you know, those of us who are like-minded really understand and see that the, the active and constructive participation of the U.S. in many cases is essential um, to getting from where we are to where we want to go. Yeah. All right. Ambassador Akram, um, the, 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 the Guterres quote that, that I mentioned at the start talks of leaders everywhere, not, not just the U.S., and this is important. Um, a lack of collaboration, unilateral approaches from many quarters, uh, uh, familiar refrains. Um, are, are leaders ready to make this commitment? Um, I think uh, um, I, I would not focus so much on the leaders, actually. I would focus on seeing where are the convergences of interests and where are the divergences that are likely to influence the decisions of leaders and, and the positions of leaders going forward. Uh, I think I, I understand um, uh, with what Mat has said with regard to uh, the positive movement uh, by the Biden administration. If we talk to our American colleagues, they keep telling us um, we are back. Uh, that's very good. Uh, but I, I think uh, the world has changed in the last few years. Uh, it is a world we, where there is now renewed uh, competition between two superpowers once again. Uh, and uh, from what the Biden administration people have said, they see their relationship with China in three dimensions. One, there is an adversarial part of it. Uh, second, there is a competitive part. And the third is a cooperative part. So I think on the, uh, the, the international institutions is the place where the cooperative part will work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that cooperation will uh, extend to climate change. It will extend to the COVID pandemic. It will extend to economic recovery promotion of the SDGs, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but even in the multilateral field, there are, there, there are aspects such as human rights where there will be less, uh, le uh, less cooperation, I think. Uh, there are divergent ideologies and approaches. Uh, and in the Security Council, um, there are issues uh, such, such as you know, the conflict in the Middle East, for example, North Korea, uh, where there is... Uh, you know, everybody is not in the same place. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, how that progresses, this will be a difficult um, way forward. And that cooperation on the, on the core security issues is likely to be impacted by the other two aspects, which is the adversarial relationship between China and the U.S. is going to cover the Indo-Pacific region, uh, as well as the competitive relationship which will probably cover trade and technology uh, pr uh, principally. So the corporate relationship, the opportunity is there to build that cooperation, but it's going to be impacted by the other two aspects of competition and mm -hmm. adversarial relationships on, on some aspects of, of the international situation. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, you said uh, to me when we talked a few weeks ago, that the pandemic is a reminder of the, the disunity of mankind, I think was the quote uh, that came from you. But you said, look, you, optimistic, you said it also showed where there's a clear objective, you know, we're able to deploy the right resources. Do you think we're getting back slowly to a place where we can um, deploy those resources when we talk about the SDGs, when we talk about climate? Um, well, we're not there yet, actually. I, I think that the that the gap between what we are aspiring to in our debates at the UN, uh, the SDGs, climate goals, uh, and once you put the money numbers against those objectives, there's imposing gaps. Uh, you know, just take the response to COVID. Uh, you have a response of $14, $15 trillion of uh, fiscal injection by the richer countries, and the, and the developing countries have yet to mobilize more than, I think, 100 billion, uh, mm. if, if that. And they need 4.2 trillion, it's estimated by the OECD. Uh, 4.2 trillion is needed. So here, right there, you have, have a gap. 
then if you see the pandemic, the vaccine distribution, you have a huge gap. COVAX uh, is underfunded by around $20 billion. Uh, if you don't have the money, then we won't have the, the vaccine for the rest of the world as it is planned. So I think there is a huge gap between our aspirations at the UN and our, and our ability to deliver on those aspirations. And, and I think the large responsibility therefore rests on those countries which are in a position to actually uh, provide the liquidity and the fiscal space that is, uh, that is needed by the poorer countries. Otherwise, you're going to have debt defaults, uh, you're going to have economic collapse in many countries, humanitarian crises, and then, of course, our, all our goals, our SDG goals, our climate goals, uh, aspirations for better human rights, uh, all of those will fall by the wayside, and yeah. you will have chaos. Okay. Um, uh, Miguel, I'll come to you in just a second on this, and I want to talk to you about China as well. But uh, uh, Governor uh, Kay Brown, let me, let, me, let me come to you first. From your perch in Oregon, uh, and as someone who's worked you know, tirelessly on a number of issues, especially climate, despite the challenges you've, you've, you've seen at the federal level, are things slowly going back to where they were? Can they go beyond that? Will they fall short of that? What's your sense right now? Well, um, thank you to all the panelists. It's truly an honor to be here and participating in this uh, wonderful uh, opportunity. Um, here's what I would say. The president, President Joe Biden, has a commitment and made a commitment to the American people that he would build back better. And I think the uh, long overdue clarion call for racial justice in the United States of America is a wake up call for all of us that too many people, particularly people of color in this country, have been left behind. And so um, I do not want to get back to normal, obviously. Um, I think we can do it better. And I agree with the ambassador um, that the pandemic showed um, the divisions, but I think it also revealed that we are all truly connected and it reveals that the issues that we are facing, whether it's climate change or uh, global health or human rights, um, they are all interconnected. And frankly, um, exactly what we are dealing with in the United States of America right now. And President Biden's first task is to rebuild trust with the American people and he is all in uh, on the American Rescue Plan. I think it's absolutely key. And the Biden team is crisscrossing the country as we speak. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, the goal is to uh, start to rebuild back uh, confidence in our U.S. government. And I think he is well on his way. Okay, very good. I, I want to come back to that in a second. Miguel, let me bring you in, though. How, how hard is it? for the UN to get things done without the US on side. I mean, when you and I spoke last week in preparation for this, you said to me, look, we've, we've still got China, we've still got the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> how, 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 how hard is it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, <clears throat> I have to tell you that there is um, a difference between what is the public rhetoric and the everyday life within the United Nations, okay? So, yes, we didn't have the U.S. in some of our uh, most important initiatives, like climate change, which is a very important cause for the Secretary General and uh, for us in the United Nations. And we had, you know, the withdrawal from WHO and other steps. But other than these very emblematic measures for the past administration, uh, there was a, a working relationship that was still effective and was still uh, taking place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the relationship with the UN has 75 years now, which is a very respectable age. And through these 75 years, we have seen a lot. And we have had the, the periods of more tense relations with the uh, with the host state of the headquarters, the the U.S. And I remind you that I mean, even when the, the second Secretary General Doug Amerskoll had some important clashes with the American administration during the McCarthyism period, and Kofi Annan had some important clashes with the U.S. administration. But again, let's not lose perspective. I think we all very much focused on our 
personal circumstances in our historical time. Yeah. Uh, the value of the UN is being truly a universal platform. Um, and the only one, by the way. So to reply to your question, it's so much better to have the US on board for everything, but the UN can still uh, do a lot of things if the US is not, is not present. But I, I guess I guess the point the point you're making is the, the UN doesn't close for business, or the UN did not close for business over the past no, no. few years, right? No, no, not at all, not at all. And even uh, I mean, I kept working with my American colleagues. You understand, so that's why I'm saying there is a difference between what the general public sees and people will focus on these very, um, very important measures like withdrawing from WHO and so on, but yeah. the, the working relationship kept going. And, uh, you know, the atomic bomb for the United Nations is to cut the financing. And, yeah. and that never happened, you know. That that would be a major crisis. Um, <laughs> Ambassador, you, you mentioned China. Um, Roy just put out a piece not too long ago. Uh, I think it was entitled something along the lines of the battle for the soul of the UN. And it was you know, what was happening in the corridors of the United Nations over the last few years, and uh, China playing a very strong PR game. Where, how, how, how reshuffled have the debt chairs become over the past few years? And how does that change the dynamic with the US and Joe Biden now, you know, putting its foot back in the door, if you like? Um. Well, you know, I, I think uh, China is now the second largest contributor uh, to the United Nations, and therefore, obviously, they would wish to have a larger role, uh, both in terms of personnel, in terms of decision-making, and, and so forth. Uh, I think uh, the easier part is accommodating them on the personnel level, and uh, to a considerable extent that has happened. And there are more Chinese in, this, in the UN system, more in the Secretariat. They had several agencies, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what is more important is the culture of the United Nations. And the culture of the United Nations is very definitely an American culture. Uh, it has been impacted from the inception. The idea, the, the concept of the United Nations was an American concept. Uh, and the charter was largely formulated by uh, the leaders of the of the United States, and that culture has 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 persisted. Uh, uh, if you see the inside of the UN, the system, uh, how it operates, so uh, the value systems within the within the Secretariat and the UN system are it's very much in, very much in American culture. So the, the Chinese, I mean, a lot of talk about PR game that they are playing. Uh, if they are, it is not working yet. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, I don't think there is any kind of major effort. They are the second largest contributor. They are trying to trying to get more influence, uh, but I don't think they're there yet. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Interesting, Ma Marta. Um, I mean, clearly, bolstering institutions is a huge part of the roadmap for renewal, and you know the the U.S. Canada peace that we saw recently, as you mentioned, with Joe Biden and, and um, Prime Minister Trudeau, you know, it was a, there was a lot of fanfare around it. How, how delicate, though, is the balance now, given what we've seen over the past few years, where China stands, where Russia stands, where some of these other players stand? What is Canada's stance on some of these other big players now? Well, look, I, I think that we are in a very uh, challenging time with uh, with uh, the emergence of, uh, of of great power competition again. I think in a way that we haven't seen um, in many years, and I think that that plays itself out across uh, many institutions um, and uh, and across many issues. Um, I think that. Uh, you know the U.S. and and ourselves, and uh, and I think the U.K. in their recent framework have, you know, have been careful to note that you know there are areas where we absolutely must work with China. We have to cooperate, and I think everyone talks about China climate change because I think it's so obvious to all of us, and it's so important and critical to all of us. 
Um, there are areas where there will be uh, competition to varying degrees and where where we will need to work in, um, in other kinds of alliances. Um, if we think about how we work together to promote democracy, if we think to, about how we work together to promote human rights, if we look at some of the work that some of us have been doing on um, media, media freedom, for example, you know, those kinds of initiatives will need to take place both within the United Nations, but also in, um, in sort of more, what I would say, fit for purpose um, alliances that we will, uh, that we'll need to work in. Um, Kate, clearly, um, the role of subnational leader has been critical over the, over the past few years. I, I wonder now, Given the, the, the impetus from, from the center again at the federal level, how this, this changes your role? There's a lot of work clearly you've done on your own, own in climate, as have other states in climate, um, on uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic response. How does the dynamic change for you now, though, with a, with a more proactive uh, federal government? Well, there's absolutely no question that the prior administration uh, not only blew up what I would consider international norms, but national norms as well. And uh, two examples, one, the response to the pandemic. Uh, the Biden administration has committed to a uh, science-based, uh, coordinated federal response. That did not happen. Essentially, the states were on their own to, ta to tackle the pandemic. It was extremely challenging. In climate change, uh, Oregon has been a leader uh, for the last uh, couple of decades, uh, but it is really hard to move forward um, given that we were a small state. Um, and to have now a federal partner that understands the impacts of climate change, both the, um, the economic impacts, the obviously environmental impacts, but the human impacts of climate change is frankly uh, quite gratifying and uh, a little long overdue. Can we, I mean, I'm, I'm bringing China back into this discussion and it's something I spoke to Marta about on the phone the other day. You know, can, can global climate progress be made without China on board? And, and, and if not, and let's face it, it probably can't. Uh, and, and therefore it is essential that the US and China in some way address their differences, right? Uh, Miguel, I don't know if you want to have a, a crack at that. I already had because I was nodding with my hand. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, no, I think it's more a rhetoric question. I mean, the answer is evident. Yeah, they're bound to to cooperate also with China and the U.S. And to have a, a, a sensible climate package without China, it's, it's nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very, it's, you, you're coming a lot around the, the China issue. You know, I think what, what happened uh, for many years is that China was very silent. Mm -hmm. but, but China is a very big country, a permanent member of the Security Council. And, and lately they've been more vocal. And, uh, and I think that the world is just uh, getting used to that fact. Yeah. Ambassador Akram, what, 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 what is your thought on that? With, with the climate piece in mind as well and working together with China. And then I'm going to move off China. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think uh, it's very difficult to move off China. <laughs> they, uh, they are a huge presence uh, in the world. Uh, uh, and, and if you talk about climate change, uh, I think uh, that, uh, China's contribution or China's participation uh, is going to be vital, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, c controlling emissions, uh, transformation to a sustainable global economy, the di digitalization uh, of the world, uh, and there are there are challenges on each of these fronts, uh, and there are there, is, there are large areas for cooperation, obviously, uh, with China, but also there are different differences in approaches, differences in metrics, and differences in a pro in, in in the programs, uh, which will all need to be meshed together uh, into uh, in, into uh, the global program for climate change. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I come back actually to, to the point that unless we can respond to the present emergency, respond to the requirements of the large majority of developing countries who are falling off 
the, <laughs> the, the global scale as far as the economy is concerned because of this pandemic, there will be no recovery. Hmm. There will be no SDGs, and they, therefore, climate change, the collaboration required for climate change, is also going to be um, virtually impossible. So everything has to be built on how we respond to, to this current pandemic, how generously, how imaginatively and innovatively we can meet the needs of, the, of developing countries at this point, especially for liquidity and fiscal space. And that is coming now. It's a decision that is going to be made in the next few months. Um, the Treasury Secretary's, uh, the U.S. Treasury Secretary's um, a recommendation for a $500 billion SDR creation was vital. It's a great signal uh, mm-hmm. of, the, of the response of the Biden administration. And if this is the kind of mindset which is brought to the debate on this issue, I think then we are looking at a good place. But if we do not all mobilize along these lines and have a global response that is commensurate with the crisis, uh, we, are, we will be in trouble. You know, I, I, I mentioned, Marta, at the top, um, you know, invigorating versus reinvigorating. You know, were we in the right place three or four years ago uh, in terms of where we were with these global institutions and what we, the strategies laid out and what we were hoping to achieve. And I talk of the G20 and the G7 and, and, and World Health Organization, and WTO. Uh, I mean, is this now an opportunity to, 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 to shift strategy, to, to you know, use this? Use, and we talk so often about using the pandemic as, as an opportunity to to change direction and to get our ducks in a row. Is this that opportunity now? Well, you know, I'd like to pick up on something that both uh, Munir and Kate have said, which is that, you know, we need to be focusing on the issues that matter to people, that matter to our populations. And to the extent that we're focusing on those issues collectively, that's the extent to which our institutions and our norms will be relevant. Um, and will and will be sustainable and will have support. And, you know, I think that um, the point about uh, the economic ramifications of COVID is a really is a really important one. Um, Canada and Jamaica um, last spring at the UN um, co-chaired a UN initiative on financing for sustainable development. Um, and the purpose of that really was to highlight these issues that we could foresee even then at the beginning of the pan- pandemic. Um, that it would have both a, a long and a disproportionate tail um, in terms of the economic impact and the differential um, impact of that, you know, which we've seen, we've all seen the same thing happening domestically as well, um, whether it's a differential racial impact, whether it's differential impact by gender, um, but certainly the economic impact on developing countries is going to be severe. So, you know, I think that that's a really important point as we think through where we focus, because there's so many issues that we need to work on together. We, we, I think, you know, the pandemic has shown we are all interconnected and we need to be working across a broad range of issues. But certainly we need to prioritize those um, that are critical and essential. Um, and, um, and, and I think we also need to keep our eye on the long game and be thinking about um, what are the emerging issues that we're not really well positioned um, to handle at this point. You know, it's normal that, um, it's normal that we need to reevaluate um, how do we strengthen the, what we have and, and what are the new and emerging issues that we really need to pay attention to? Yeah. Um, and very quickly, about it, a question comes in asking if there was a document from the Jamaica and Canada discussion. Um, I guess if there was, and I imagine there was, um, then we can get it to uh, whoever's, uh, who, whoever has asked that question. Um, you know, on the, on the financial side and the regulatory side, I wonder if the G20 is as fundamental, as, as, as fundamentally important now as it was in the wake of the, of, of the financial crisis. Uh, and, you know, anyone take that, uh, Miguel or Ambassador Akram, uh, um, I, I, I wonder the G20 and the way it addressed issues around the financial crisis, whether it's lost some of its zest now. Okay, let me take that. Uh, actually, first, first of all, uh, in answer to, to your question about the Jamaica Canada Initiative, I understand there are there are papers which set out 259 options 
for a response to the economic crisis uh, unleashed by, by the pandemic. So again, there we have to select uh, the five or six uh, that, that are important. And obviously debt is one of them, liquidity, SDR creation, concessional finance, ODA, and climate finance. These are all the, the major vehicles which will be res- necessary to respond to the financial uh, uh, financial uh, crisis. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, we need to prioritize. Uh, and and I think uh, that the G20 has been focused on one a debt suspension, which is which is very small relief, uh, and it's very limited to a certain number of countries. They've got a debt uh, framework now, which has to be elaborated. Uh, but they have not yet come out on the SDR issue, and they need to. Uh, they need to come out you know, on on the other aspects, the concessional financing issue, the ODA issue, and and the and the other issues uh, which require uh, immediate action uh, for for the developing countries. And and I think uh, the IMF, IBRD is going to be important. The ECOSOC, which meets next month and has a, has the Financing for Development Forum, is going to be important. We've got to see what we can agree on. If we can agree on, on a set of priority measures to meet this crisis, to respond to the fiscal and liquidity crisis in the developing world, I think it would be a good start. And that's why I'm very encouraged by the statement of the U.S. Treasury Secretary. I hope that's reflected in all aspects of the program that we hope to launch at the FFD Forum, and I hope it will be reflected in the IMF IBRD, that it will impact on the Group of, 20, group of 20s meetings, the Paris Club, etc. But, the, uh, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy um, that the Canada-Jamaica initiative was taken. Uh, my Prime Minister was the first in April to launch a debt, debt relief uh, initiative, a call for debt relief, and and we are very happy with the with the Canada Jamaica initiative. It's it's done made made a major contribution, and it's brought the United Nations informally, of course, but it's brought the United Nations to uh, to display what it can do because yeah. it's a universal forum. We were all there. We all sat. We all expressed our, our positions, and I think it's it's a great demonstration of the capacity of the United Nations to to deliver. Yeah. On global. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Kate, what, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about climate. What, what are you prioritizing now in, uh, in, in Oregon? And how, how, how can you be part of a greater part of this invigoration, this reinvigoration, this reinvigorating, whatever, whatever we want to call it now? <laughs> Recreating a better world. Um, I, I think there are a couple of pieces. Um, I signed an executive order to uh, cap uh, emissions, carbon emissions here in Oregon, and my agencies are working to implement that executive order. Um, But I think it's really key that um, the states as subnationals continue to partner with other subnationals on a global level. And we participated, um, continued to participate in global efforts uh, even during the Trump administration, and I anticipate we will continue to participate. We can all learn from one another, and we will continue to do that. But moving forward, uh, the USA, under President Biden's leadership, is going to show up and participate. Um, these are incredibly complex issues. Um, we all need to be working collectively to tackle them. And uh, Oregon will continue to play a leadership role, I believe, uh, at the national level. And hopefully we can continue to partner with other folks internationally as well. Okay. Um, um, Miguel, who, big, big question, but, you know, I'm wary of the time and I want to come back to, you know, the title of this. Who, who's in charge of the international world order right now, would you say? <laughs> I think um, the big powers, international institutions in their respective fields of um, of activity. You know, you mentioned the G20. I, I work for the G1193, so it has relevance for a few aspects. You have the Security Council, you have uh, 
you know, power is very fragmented right now. Um, but, is that a problem? Uh, I don't know. It's what it's what we have now. Mm-hmm. So we have to work with the, the the reality that we're living in. And uh, Martha mentioned something interesting about the relevance of international organizations that we have to strive to remain relevant and so on. I think that pr- that process is never over. I came across books from the late 40s and early 50s about the reform of the United Nations. I think we, we live in this flux of permanently trying to adapt to the circumstances. There are different centers of power and uh, with different um, gaps, but um, but I think basically it's very fragmented right now, and, uh, and that, that's it. I, I want to get a sense, and I've just got a little note saying our event's set to end soon, and I, to be honest, I feel like we're really just getting started. <laughs> I've got so much to talk about here. Um, but I, I, want to get a, I want to get a sense from each of you just how, I guess this is what I'm trying to do with this session, really how optimistic you are that, that things are now being reinvigorated, that, that we are you know, moving forward in a way in which the Secretary General has has laid out and, and hopes. Uh, the way in which uh, Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Biden uh, laid it out in their in their partnership um, um, announcement when they got together. Marta, let me kick it off with you. Uh, do you feel that optimism? Are you, you know, cl- clearly you all want it, but 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 realistically, how close are we? Um, Axel, I don't think we have a choice. Um, I think if there's one thing that this uh, experience with the COVID over the last year has shown us is that, you know, we are interrelated, we are together, we are connected on this planet, um, and we have to make this work. And uh, so I'm, I tend towards optimism anyways, but yes, I'm optimistic that uh, we will understand that and we will act on it. You know, I, I don't want to be the one playing devil's advocate, but I, I, I guess that's, you know, so often my role. You know, Miguel, do do you the corridors of the United Nations? Is it full of worry that three years down the road we might have a an America First agenda, foreign policy agenda back that we're going to have to contend with? And how does that affect this 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 drive now? Well, that that I mean, again, I'm an optimist. On that, I would uh, I would I would regret, but that's national politics. The United Nations uh, has to work with what it has. I mean, again, we are a universal platform. We have to work with every national government. That would be bad news for what the multilateral agenda means. And uh, I'm a lot of bad things for that school of thinking because I'm a globalist, I'm a cosmopolitan, I'm an internationalist, and I'm also an optimist. (laughs) It's a risk. I mean, the best situation is described by a cartoon I've seen The Economists, where Uncle Sam is asking Europe for a dance, and they're having a dance, and then Uncle Sam is assigned America first, just drops Europe, who falls in the floor, and then when he turns back to her again, shall we dance again? She's a big <laughs> uh, I hope we will not see ourselves in that situation. Uh, on the pandemic, the pandemic was a huge stress test to what we have, but it's also a very important reminder that whatever it takes, we are bound to cooperate. We don't have an alternative. Um, Kate, uh, Joe Biden. I mean, cl- clearly your role in the in the the, the, the stimulus and the, the package and the selling of that. I mean, clearly you've got everyone at the governor level has a has a, has a big role to play here. Joe Biden clearly sees selling the stimulus. As, as key to keeping the Democrats in, in, in the White House. How, how do you keep that momentum going through the midterms uh, into 24? How hopeful are you? Axel, just so you know, I'm also an optimist. And so I'm uh, relatively uh, uh, excited about the future. Uh, in terms of the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration, I think um, they are committed to changing the dynamics around the midterm election. and. The American Relief Package is the best example. Um, They have learned from the experiences of the Obama administration. Know um, what the benefits of this package will be. So 
Um, and I think that's just the uh, appetizer, so to speak. I think the infrastructure package is next and they're ready to go full bore on this. So I, I obviously too early to say whether that changes the dynamics of the midterms, but again, I'm uh, very uh, optimistic and very excited about the opportunities ahead. And I will say this, I think the dynamics around the Republican Party are extremely challenging right now. Um, I see it at the state level, at the subnational level. I'm watching it at the national level. So um, as my panelists, my fellow panelists said, we have no other option. And the lens is a bit different, at least for the United States, um, that our goal has to be um, to build uh, more inclusively um, and uh, frankly, uh, more equitably moving forward. Uh, and so we're going to, we're committed, we're all in, and we're going to make it happen to the extent that we have the power to do so. Okay. Yeah. Ambassador Akram, you know, I, I, I'm an optimist as well, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, I, I cannot get this quote, the, the, the Antonio Guterres quote from September out of my head when he said, you know, if, 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 if the world deals with climate the way they, they de dealt with this pandemic, we're, we're in deep trouble. Um, you know, back to your uh, quote, Yonea, the pandemic being a reminder of the disunity of mankind. You know, when, when, when do you think you might be in a position to say, look, this is a really good example?